morning. We are glad that you're here, wherever you are online or here in the room. Why don't you stand with us right now? Let's sing this song together. Let's praise his name. We're glad that you're here, whether you're on the internet or right here in this room. Most of all, God is here. Let's sing to him. Step out of his arms. Step out of tell you all how good it is to hear people sing in this room and clapping. I'm just, this is, this is great. I, I never realized how much I missed it until you all were gone for two months. And this is great to have so many of you with us back again. It says this in Isaiah 42. It says, sing to the Lord a new song. His praise of the earth. So I love this passage that talks about singing a new song to 
pray together, okay? God, you have called us to a grander purpose for the church to arise and see real changes in our world and especially in our community here in central Indiana. God, you have called us to see your kingdom come. As you said in the book of Matthew, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And God, as, as, we, as we open our country again and, and we have more opportunities to interact, God, I pray you will use that for your purpose to, spe- to see people come to you, to a saving knowledge of, of you, to, to want to love you. And God, to, to be here and uh, to be part of this church, but not just attend church, but see your glory in their lives. 
God, we pray that that will happen, that more uh, light bulbs will appear over on the other side there, people who want to, uh, who have chosen to follow you. God, I just pray that we have to build another, another wood panel there uh, by the end of the year and see more people wanting to come and follow you. So God, may that happen. And God, we give you glory and praise and recognize that these, this is your purpose. This is your vision. This is what you want to see. And God, help us, help us to accomplish that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
God, may you hear our praises, and God, may you move as only you can. God, we're human with, with all that we can do as human beings, but God, you ultimately move in the hearts of your people and in people who need to hear the truth. So God, I pray that you would move as only you can. And as we do that, we'll give you all the credit for what you have done. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. What is worship? Worship is, um, um, I don't know. It's kind of a hard thing to define. A religion type thing to devote yourself, um, your heart and your soul and your mind fully. I guess worship would be like a way of paying tribute. Worship is, you know, praising God. Worship is any type of celebration of something that you believe to be greater than yourself. Praising, you know, whatever you believe in, whether it be God, whether it be Jesus, whether it be Allah, or, you know, whatever God that you choose, you know, that you believe in. Singing and praying. Okay, if you worship a friend, that means you want to spend majority of your time learning about that friend. How do you worship? Um, well, I guess everyone worships a little differently. Uh, I, th I think you can, you know, have your own kind of like worship, your own religion. I think people all worship in their own way, so. I would say I worship in many ways. Um, I'm a Methodist and I go to church. I go to church every week and just individual prayer time, I guess. Pray, pray on my own. Silent meditation, sing songs, read hymns, stuff like that. I worship as I spend time reading God's word. How do you worship? I pray. Say a prayer at night every time I get a chance. I sing, dance, um, give praise. Is there a right or wrong way to worship? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's whatever makes you feel most comfortable. I don't think there's like one way to worship, but there could be a wrong way to worship. I think some people worship just to, um, it's more of a social thing. A lot of times, actually, we start worshiping other things, putting God aside, and we worship our own idols, whether it is ourself or our figure or our whatever our friends um i think a lot of times we put put other things above god if you're a christian there's a certainly a way to worship it comes down to is how you relate yourself to god i think it's whichever way you want to express yourself you believe worship takes place more than just on sundays yes most definitely i think it's an everyday thing for sure worship is what you do every day isn't something you do one day a week on a sunday it's something that you do every day there have been times on a friday night where i've definitely felt more drawn to god than a sunday morning i don't think it's just something you do on sunday morning i think it's it's a lifestyle it's a lifestyle it's more like a lifestyle than uh than say singing or you know music in church it's a, it's about the way you live and about how you glorify god with your life so it's an important question uh, first, what do you, how do you define worship? The, the second is, how do you worship? And, and the third is, is there a right or wrong way to worship? Now, we tend to think what we do on this hour on Sunday morning is worship. But we're going to find out today there's a whole lot more to it than that. Uh, I will tell you a little bit of a story that, that when, when my kids were young, we would do this thing that I affectionately called colonial night. Now, what, what that was is you, you turn off all the lights, you turn off all electronics, uh, everything that's a distraction, and you just dial in on each other. You know, you just have candles, and, and, and that's the colonial part. And, and the truth is my family all made fun of me um, for, for having us do this. I'm just trying to increase connection and, and communication and creativity, and, uh, and, and, and they just think it's goofy. And, and they made sure they told me that too, by the way. It was often communicated to me. But, but, but the idea was simply that we would disconnect from all the distractions and, and dial in on each other. And, and, and it, was, it was kind of uh, interesting then how short-lived Colonial Night was. Now, I, I tell you that story because I really think that that's what this hour on Sunday can kind of be. This, this time where we really unplug ourselves from everything and, and focus in on the Lord. But our time of focusing in on the Lord isn't relegated to or limited to what we do in an hour on Sunday morning, whether here or online. Actually, what the Bible tells us is that worship is, in fact, a whole attitude or way of thinking about God. 
So, so in this Insta Family series, I felt like it was important to clue, include God's picture for family worship and how we grow in our understanding of that. And, and it, was, it was interesting that uh, today uh, Phil mentioned the, the Shema Yisrael, which we talked about in our introduction, or that thing that was repeated over and over again by Hebrew families. And so uh, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw your attention to that again uh, if, if you have a Bible with you, even on your device or at home, you have a Bible on your device, I really encourage you today to actually turn to that, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're, because I want you to really get the whole picture around the, the part that we're going to focus in on so you see it all in context. Now, you know me in context. We're always going to make sure you understand what the environment was around it, what the context was it was said. So here's Moses. He's together with all of his people as they've completed this 11-day journey that took them 40 years. And they're standing there at at the Jordan, and he's giving them some last-minute advice and and, and encouraging them. And, and, And so he summarizes the journey that they've all been on, tells them, again, what God had done for them, and then he reminds them, ultimately, of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments. Now, the interesting thing about that is he says to them not only the Ten Commandments themselves, but that those commandments came out of the mouth of God in fire. And so the tribal leaders of of all the 12 tribes came to Moses and said, okay, look, if we have to stand in in the voice of fire, we'll never live through it. We can't go before God like you. So will you go before God and say to him, look, Just tell us what you want us to do when we go into the land, and we'll do it. So Moses does that. He approaches God. He says, God, everybody says that if you'll just tell them what to do, they will do it. And God says, oh, I wish they would have been like that at the beginning. And oh, I wish I knew they would be like that in the future. You go back and tell them that if they'll follow my commands, they will enjoy a prosperous life. And now when he says that, Moses then goes back to them and he tells them this, Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning with the first verse. These are all the commands, the laws, and regulations that the Lord your God told me to teach you so you may obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. And so you and your children and your grandchildren might fear the Lord your God as long as you live. And if you obey all his laws and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Now, here's what he's trying to explain to them. Whatever or whoever has the greatest worth to get your time and your resources and your attention, that's your God. That's who you worship. The truth that brings us to this definition then, worship is acknowledging the worth of something. So in our case, we believe God is worthy of all of our praise and all of our lives, so we worship God. We worship him in Jesus' name. Now, the question that we all need to answer today, here, online, every one of us needs to answer this simple question. How much is God worth to you versus all of the other affections and interests in your life? Now, now be clear Because all of the other affections and interests in your life can become idols. And so he's saying, is he the one who's going to get all of your worship, all of your focus, or are you going to try to divide it up between him and other gods in your life? And that's why he's telling them, Moses is looking at the people just before they go into the promised land, and he says this, worship is the heartbeat of my personal life. That's what you need to understand, each one of you. Worship must be the heartbeat of your personal life. Now, we, only, we tend to think that worship is relegated or only what happens here with singing and praying and studying the Bible and connecting with one another. And this is where we worship. And those, I just want to be clear, those are all good things and definitely things we should do in this corporate worship experience. But the real test of worship is how you live when you leave the corporate worship experience and enter into your life of personal worship, daily worship. 
So, so notice the law God hands to his people. It's more than what happens in their sacrificial system in the temple, although all of that was exceedingly important. He's saying, my laws and my commands, how you live daily is the ultimate expression of who you think is most important. And when you discover who God is and that he's worth worshiping, then you realize that worship is expressed through obedience to his design. The picture he's painted for your life, you live by it, and that is your act of worship. So, so here's what he says. I mean, this is what was part of it. So you and your children and your grandchildren might fear the Lord your God as long as you live. He's telling them to pass this fear of God on. Now, this word fear, you need to understand, it's not just being scared of, although let me make sure you're clear Fear, as we know the word fear, is a part of how we look at God. He is almighty. But the word also means respect, honor, reverence. That we fear God in that way. It shows you can practice acts of worship here while living a holy life of worship as well. Because, you know, that, that's what happens. Honestly, some people can come here, raise their hands, sing the song, close their eyes, feel very emotional about this hour on Sunday and just go out of here and live a life that's completely opposite of what we've just talked about. That heart, that mentality shows you do not have a heart for worshiping God, the God who made you and the God who saved you. But when your worship here reminds you and teaches you who God is, you realize that you not, must not only worship him in song or prayer, but that you must worship him in obedience to his laws and commands, and you should pass those on to your children. Now, understand, this is for every person here. If you're single, living alone, this is for you because he's calling you to a life of worship. If you're a married couple, no kids, it's for you. You should be investing in each other. If you're a family with children, you should be passing these on to your children. If your children are gone, you have grandchildren, passing all of this on to your grandchildren. Look, I'm, it's not me. I'm just telling you what God said. And he's encouraging you to live your life that way because he ends this with a promise. And here's what he says. If you obey all his laws and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Now, you, he's not just talking about your earthly life, but you're going to enter into a faith relationship with him that will give you eternal life. And that's what we're really living for. Now, I, I don't know if some of you were here for the, the series I called All, A-L-L. Uh, last year when we talked about that. And in that series, I, I talked about Christian athletes who often share their testimonies and they use their athletics as a metaphor often to talk about that relationship with God. And, and one of the things that, that Christian athletes like to do in sharing their story is say that Jesus is number one in my life. And they want to make sure everybody understands he's the most important. And, and it's a great thing to say and it's a great metaphor to use. But, but men and women, I just want you to know, Jesus does not want to be number one in your life. He does not want to be number one in your life. He wants to be the only one in your life. Jesus doesn't want to just be some line on the page and you got him number one, Jesus, and then all this other stuff. And so every day you get up and you check off Jesus because you say a prayer or something. No, no, no. He doesn't want to be a line on your page. He wants to be the page. He wants everything in your life, every line on your page to be a reflection of your worship of him, that he is the only one that you are living for. That's his design for the human race. Now, see, that shows then that worship applies to every area of your life. So when you go to work, you work as if it's an offering to God, worship to God. When you go to school, when you play sports, when you're in the band, when you're out with your friends, when you're private, you recognize that everything I'm doing is an expression of whether or not I've made worship my heartbeat, my passion. That's what he's telling them in Deuteronomy. And that's why Paul, when he wrote a letter to the Corinthians, he said, whether you eat or sleep or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 
Now, that eating part can be a little convicting. But he's saying you, every aspect of your life is an opportunity to worship God. Worship is your life's purpose. Now, he doesn't stop with just you, though. And that's what becomes exceedingly important. We hinted to that earlier. He explains that your heartbeat of worship becomes something that you demonstrate as an example to pass on through your family and your sphere of influence. So, Moses tells them what to do with this obedient life of worship. And that's the statement that I mentioned to you earlier called the Shema Yisrael, that every Hebrew family would get up every single day and they would quote it. They memorize it, they quote it, this is it. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, here it is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you are away on a journey, when you're lying down and when you're getting up again. See, he's saying to the family leaders, whether it's fathers or single parents, he's saying to those leaders, you need to be teaching these commands to your children, to your families. You need to pass it on. Now, it brings me to another question, which is, what is your family memorizing and quoting that demonstrates who is worthy of your worship? I mean, what is it? What are the lessons that you're repeating? What are the conversations that you're having in your house that show your family and the world that, in fact, he is your only God? You see, that, that's where it goes from worship being the heartbeat of my personal life to worship being the heartbeat of my family life. You see, the teaching method of repetition is not new or modern. They've been doing it for a long time. And if we value something, we pass along that value to our family, our spouse, our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, nephews, cousins, siblings. We are sharing this with everybody else that's in our home. Now, we've often talked about the clear and present battle for our affections. You have enemies in your life fighting for your attention and fighting for your affection. They become your focus. Now, that's what the Bible calls idols. It's it's not just these graven images, these things that people form and that they bow down to. For instance, these people in the wilderness during that 40-year period at one point when Moses was up in Sinai fashioned a cow. And they bowed down to this golden calf. And it became their God. It made God angry. But it's not relegated to just these images that we carve out and bow down to. An an idol is anything, anything that you allow to steal your affection and your worship away from the Lord. Anything I believe is worthy of my attention more than the Lord. So Moses declares There's only one God, the Lord, and he alone is to be trusted and obeyed and worshipped. And our homes need to reflect that. That's what he was saying. Here's what your family life looks like. Here's the picture. Here's your Insta photo. Here's what you post that your family is all about the worship of God. Not only on the weekends, but our homes should daily be fueled and energized by our passionate worship our passionate pursuit of the Lord himself. Now, again, this worship is reflected in our supreme desire to trust that his words, his commands, his laws are good and true and best for us. And then what we ultimately value will become a value for everyone else in our family. At least we're going to teach that value to them. Now, leaders... Take note here. Leaders in the family, take note. Because here's what he says. You must commit yourself, here it is, wholeheartedly to these commands I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again 
to your children. Now, there are many things that we try to repeat over and over again to our children, so they memorize them. You know, we, we repeat over and over again multiplication tables. We repeat over and over again certain dates and events in history, and we make sure that they know those things. We repeat over and over again the laws of the land, or we repeat over and over again lines from Napoleon Dynamite and Nacho Libre. Only 12 people in the room know what I'm talking about there, but... You know, the fact is that we, we do this idea of memorizing things and repeating things or we don't. The question is, do we make sure that our families are well-versed in the words of God? Do the things we spend our most time on in our families instill in our families a heartbeat for worshiping God? See, he even tells them to talk about it when they're on vacation. He even says this thing is so important, we need to talk about it before bed. And when we wake up in the morning, repetition again and again, he says. Well, why? Well, here's why, and you need to get this. Because every human being is bombarded with messages that compete for their affections. There are, there are things drag pulling at you all the time to pull you away from God and pull you into their favor. See, you and your children will be absorbing thousands of images that attempt to capture your worship. And the worth of God in making him the heartbeat of our lives is emphasized in our homes if we hope to guard our, ho- our hearts. And we're going to talk about that a lot more uh, on Father's Day when we talk about the protecting of our families. Look, I-, I mean this. I hope your son or daughter can hit a curveball. I hope they can. But, and when you're out in the backyard working on them with their curveball and trying to make sure they can hit it, make sure they also know the Ten Commandments with every pitch. I mean, make sure that they also know the things of God. I hope your kids can memorize the Declaration of Independence, but make sure that they know that it is rooted and grounded in the Word of God and show them the parts of the Word of God that impacted the writing of the Declaration of Independence. I hope the couples that are watching this or here um, who have, a, I hope you have amazing date nights where you go out to the movies or you go out for dinner or whatever it is you do. And I hope those are wonderful and romantic and draw you together, but you should also be praying together and reading God's word together and worshiping God in your homes. You know, I'll never forget it. I was in college, and I hadn't seen this, honestly, before. Um, I, when I went and did an internship one summer at a church in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and, and the way it worked is uh, the, the person that I was living with didn't have to take, feed me every night. They found a, a family in the church to feed me every night. So I'm not kidding. Every single night, I got to go to somebody's house for dinner. It was amazing. Amazing. But, but what really shocked me, the very first night I was there, and I went to this family's home. I'd never seen this before. We eat dinner, we laugh, we have a good time talking, a little dessert, and then all of a sudden the dad of the home goes and gets his Bible and sits down, opens it up, chooses a verse there that he'd been thinking about, and gives it to one of their kids, and that, and that kid reads it out loud. And then dad takes this devotional that he had, and it was short, it was a single thought, and he read that single thought to his family, they talked about it briefly, they prayed together, and then off they went. Now, it was interesting, like I said, I'd never seen that in a home before. I thought you did that kind of stuff at church. And, and, and every, all of a sudden, I realized every house I was going to, they were doing this. I mean, whoever was hosting me, a single mom, it was a married couple, whoever it was, they were reading the word to their families, praying together, I mean, talking about it, praying together before they went on with their evenings. And I thought, that is really cool. And, and so as I... As I enter into a family life, I'm like, I'm doing that too. I'm going to make sure my family knows the word of God. I'm going to make sure we talk about it. I'm going to make sure even on vacation we talk about it. Because I want them to, as a matter of fact, now we even, we would, we would take, go through holidays and do special events like this. Like at Christmas during Advent, we get our own Advent wreath 
and we light the candles and, and, we, and we have them uh, read the scriptures and tell the stories and we'd sing a song and then they'd get chocolate and, and then that's how it worked. The whole point was to emphasize this word, this God, is who we worship in this home. That's who our heart beats for. So ultimately, it becomes contagious in the family and then outside of the family. So, so the second half of Deuteronomy 6.11, let, let me start there and, and read. When you have eaten your fill in this land, be careful not to forget the Lord, who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. You must fear the Lord your God and serve him. And when you take an oath, you must use only his name. And you must not worship any of the gods of neighboring nations, for the Lord your God who lives among you is a jealous God. So, so in other words, okay, I, I think I'm getting it now. Not only should worship be the heartbeat of my personal life, not only should worship be the heartbeat of my family life, but actually the more I know God, the more my heart beats for him. And, and, and that's why I should practice it, because it increases my desire to worship. Now, remember the context of everything Moses has said. He's summarizing the 40-year journey after they escaped from slavery from Egypt. And, and, and then he says this, don't forget how God rescued you from the land of slavery. Train your mind, discipline your mind to not only repeat the stories of his salvation, but think about how that salvation should impact your heart and your mind and your life moving forward. You see, the goal of knowing this law, here's what he says. Let me remind you again. You must fear the Lord your God and serve him. You see, here's the thing. In the land that they were moving into, they were about to be introduced to a lot of other gods that the people who were in that land already worshipped. And he said, make sure your mind is trained upon the true God or they will pull your affection away from him. And, and by the way, they didn't follow through on their promise. When they said they would follow God no matter what, just tell us what you want us to do, he told them, and they didn't do it. And they got sucked in to a life of worshiping other gods, giving their affections to other things. They didn't train their minds to focus on the true God. They didn't follow through on the repetition of his law, his word, his history. And, and that's why he directed them, and that's why he directs us to continue learning, continue meditating, continue memorizing, and continue repeating and growing in our understanding of who he is. Because he said it here, he's jealous for our affection. I just want you to know this is not an open relationship. You can only have one God when it comes to our God. And he's saying, I want all of your heart. I want no competition for your heart. You know, it's funny, my mom was a teacher, an elementary teacher, and once a year, she would take her class to this old one-room schoolhouse building. Uh, they, they, it still existed in our county, and it would, they had this program where they, they had the kids dress up like Prairie Days and they Pioneer Days, and they'd go to this one-room schoolhouse and have school all day that day. Now, the interesting thing about the one-room schoolhouse was, was how the, what the teaching method was like. The teacher would actually focus the, the teaching on the older students. And they would learn new things. And then they would teach the things they already had learned previously to the younger children. And so the reason that would happen is not only would they learn things from their teacher, but they would be rep repeating over and over again in teaching someone else the other important things that they had already learned. Maybe we should go back to those. Maybe some of you remember those. That was supposed to be funny. I don't know where you are. Now, now look, here's the thing. Maybe that's the method we should be using in our homes 
as first we lead ourselves. So even a single person in this room today, you are leading yourself. And as you draw into God's word, then you pass it on or teach it to someone else. So not only are you learning it, but you're repeating it when you share it with someone else. And every time you share the word of God, stories of God, your own story of faith with your children or others in your family, it's an opportunity for you to remember the one true God who made you and saved you and has given you the promise of eternal life. And so pass on your daily devotions to your family. Whatever it is he's teaching you, share it with others. Fathers, lead yourself and lead your family. Other leaders in families, lead yourself and lead your family. You know, uh, in that series that I mentioned earlier, the all series, we focused on the fact that Jesus When asked what is the greatest commandment, he quoted the Shema Yisrael. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know, men and women, I just got to be honest with you. Uh, I believe that if we as God's people were loving God with all our hearts, worshiping him, it would then translate into the way we love our neighbors as ourselves. And therefore, we would see the intrinsic value of every human being. And then we wouldn't have to be fighting divisive wars and racist wars and and have to be out protesting. Because we would have a people who see value in everyone and want to communicate the love and grace and mercy of God to everyone. But it starts, if maybe, just in my home. Well, maybe it just starts in me. Maybe it starts in you. Where you're way more interested in communicating the love and mercy, grace, and forgiveness of God to others than you are with going out with with angry, emotional tirades, posting on social media, or screaming and yelling about all of this in, in your relationship with your friends where you simply say, we must stand for justice. We must stand for equality. And we must love one another and do whatever it is that we can do to assure that everyone is respected and honored. And if there's anything we need to teach our children, it's that lesson. That lesson that God loves the world the whole world, everyone in the world. And because of that, we should too. Now, you know where you discover that lesson? (laughs) Worship. Worshiping God through his word, worshiping God through prayer, worshiping God together with the body of Christ, either here online, and we hope you online, or coming back soon. We, We want to be a reflection of the love and grace of Jesus. And I hope and pray, this is what I hope and pray for our church, that your heart is beating hard today to worship God here and in every area of your life. Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, we start our response today with a confession we confess that there, is, there are so many things that we've allowed to divert our attention away from honoring you. Forgive us, Lord. When we failed, when we've sinned, we pray that you would show us that. And I pray especially that if there is any racism, any prejudice, any hate in me, you would reveal it to me. And that each one in this room would pray that same prayer. And that we, as the body of Christ, passionately worshiping you, would be enlightened to love and how to share it with our world. Lord, awaken us today to worship. And I pray you'll help us to give every aspect of our life to you. Would you pray your own prayer in response? First, asking God to open your eyes to any sin or, 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 or racism or prejudice or, or anger in you that he would, you would ask him to forgive you and then ask him to make you a true worshiper, not just here, but in every area of your life. 
pray those two prayers. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would put within us a deeper desire to that end, that you would wash us of all of the competing affections and you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. And then, Lord, we pray that we would be a reflection of your love, your grace, your mercy. We would be part of the solution to changing our world and pointing them to you. So we give ourselves to you today to that end. Show us how to worship in our homes, in our church, at work, at school, in our community. And we'll thank you for this great gift of love. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's stand. If you're home, stand. Everybody stand and let's continue that worship attitude as we sing together and honor his name.
with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all I'll stand my soul Lord to you surrender all I am is yours I'll stand got a lot to pray about in our country, in our world. We are praying for healing. We're praying for divisions to be mended, and we're praying for our own hearts to be open to what God wants to teach us and how to connect with one another. We're praying that our church would be able, as you heard Phil earlier talk about, our church would be able to come back together soon, and it will be a safe place to do that. I want to remind you that next week, uh, the masks are optional. We're just following the governor's plan unless he changes his mind and decides to continue with this. Then we're just going to follow their leadership and, and do the right thing because a ma- as, as awful as it is to sing in a mask, um, it, it, it doesn't have to inhibit our hearts from worshiping God. So um, thank you all for being part of that and being so great about that when you've come here. 